Hey guys, I'm Faida and today we're going to be talking about the African diaspora in Brazil. Freedom Did you know that Brazil has the biggest African diaspora community outside of Africa? The 2010 census in Brazil showed that for the first time, the majority of the Brazilian population identified as Afro-descendant. 50.7% of Brazilians, the equivalent of over 100 million people, self-identified as black or mixed race. The statistics I'm about to give you are truly staggering. The transatlantic slave trade as we know it began when the Portuguese completed the first transatlantic slave voyage to Brazil in 1526. From 1501 to 1866, an estimated 4.9 million enslaved Africans were trafficked to Brazil. That's nearly 40% of all slaves traded in the transatlantic slave trade, and at least four times the number of slaves that were trafficked to the United States. Brazil was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery in 1888. Slave labor was the driving force behind several key industries in Brazil, including sugar production, gold and diamond mining, coffee production, and agriculture. As was the case across Latin America, enslaved Africans in Brazil escaped and formed maroon settlements called quilombos, the most famous of which was Quilombo dos Palmares, which existed for most of the 17th century. It was a relatively large quilombo with a population of several thousand escaped slaves and indigenous people who formed a complex and structured society. At its height, it had a population of 30,000 people and spanned over 11 villages, occupying a landmass the size of Portugal. The most famous Afro-Brazilian slave resistance leader was Zumbi, the last king of Palmares, who led the fierce counter-attack against the Portuguese forces trying to seize the Quilombo. Although the settlement was captured in 1695 and Zumbi was decapitated, today he is a powerful symbol of resistance against slavery in Brazil and Portuguese colonial rule. To this day, the descendants of Afro-Brazilians living in Quilombo settlements fight for the right to their ancestral land. In 2018, for the first time, a Quilombo community was given land titles when the Cachoeira Poteira community of 500 people was formally granted 220,000 hectares of Amazonian rainforest. A key turning point was the Haitian Revolution, which ended in 1804, whereby the Afro-descendant population of Haiti rebelled against the white French elite and claimed their independence, both from French colonial rule and their European slave masters. This sent shockwaves across Latin America, which were felt as far as Brazil. Some Afro-Brazilians even wore portraits of Haitian revolutionary leader Jean-Jacques de Salines in pendants around their necks. However, after the collapse of the sugar industry in Haiti, it was Brazil that catered to the increased demand for sugar. Enslaved Africans continued to be imported in large numbers to the region of Bahia. From the Haitian Revolution onwards, slave rebellions became more frequent and more brutal. The largest rebellion occurred in 1835 in Salvador and was known as the Malé Uprising. It was orchestrated by African-born Muslim slaves who intended to free all of the slaves in Bahia. However, the rebellion was crushed and many participants were arrested, executed, flogged or deported. Relations were tense between enslaved Africans who had recently been imported and the enslaved Afro-Brazilians who had been born into slavery on Brazilian soil. The Afro-Brazilians were comprised of blacks and mulatos who were mixed with the European ancestry of their slave masters. They were treated better, were more likely to be emancipated, often because they were the slave master's children, and had greater opportunity for social mobility once they had been freed. In fact, it was not uncommon for wealthy free blacks and mulatos in Brazil to have slaves of their own. It was arguably these internal divisions that held the enslaved population back from staging a successful revolt. Although Brazil gained its independence from Portugal in 1822, slavery wasn't formally abolished until 1888, when Princess Isabel of Brazil passed the Lei Aurea, the Golden Act. This made Brazil the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. The sheer amount of slaves that had been trafficked to Brazil during the slavery era meant that the Brazilian population was now majority black and Afro-descendant. At a time when scientific racism was gaining popularity, 
the Brazilian government sought to whiten the racial profile of the country. It implemented a tactic called whitening, whereby from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, Brazil encouraged and even subsidized the mass influx of white European immigrants to Brazil. The countries with the highest numbers settling in Brazil were Italians, Portuguese and Spanish. Although this didn't eradicate blackness from Brazil, it reinforced the trope that whiteness should be aspired to and that marrying someone whiter was an instrument of social mobility. In the 20th century, the black movement in Brazil gained momentum. A defining moment was in 1931 when the Frente Negra Brasileira was formed, the first black political party in Brazil, organized by Arlindo Vega dos Santos. The party put forward candidates for political office, ran literacy classes, health clinics and legal services for black communities across Brazil. They also published a newspaper called A Voz de Raça, which circulated news about black communities both in Brazil and overseas. The party was short-lived, however, when in 1937, the Brazilian dictator Getúlio Vargas dissolved all political parties. From the 1950s onwards, there were a number of black social movements in Brazil that lobbied for black rights. One of the most famous was the Unified Black Movement, also known as the MNU, founded in 1978, which is arguably the most influential black organization in Brazil in the second half of the 20th century. Among things, the organization spoke out against police brutality, the oppression of black women, and discrimination against the LGBTQ community. In 1995, the MNU helped organize the March for Zumbi in the capital of Brasilia. The event protested racism in Brazil and also celebrated the anniversary of the death of Zumbi, the slave resistance leader who was the last king of the Quilombo dos Palmares. With a turnout of over 40,000 people, it was the largest national black demonstration in Brazil. In recent years, social media has played a pivotal role in black political activism in Brazil, particularly amongst Afro-Brazilian millennials. Social media platforms such as YouTube, Instagram and Facebook have allowed Afro-Brazilians to connect and mobilise online. Social media provides a forum to discuss the collective struggle, but crucially it has also allowed the dissemination of photos and video footage showing police brutality against Afro-Brazilians. One such example is the murder of Claudia da Silva Ferreira, who passed away in 2014 after a police van dragged her down the road for over a thousand feet. The grisly incident was captured on camera and circulated on social media, sparking national outrage. The Black Lives Matter movement in particular gained traction with Afro-Brazilian youths, who coined the hashtag Vidas Negras Importam. The fact that an unprecedented number of people self-identified as black and mixed race in the 2010 Brazilian census shows that Brazilians are prouder and more willing to claim their African heritage than ever before. However, the census also brought to light the grave disparities between the distribution of wealth amongst white and Afro-descendant Brazilians. The socio-economic gap between white and black Brazilians persists. The 2010 census found that in major cities, white Brazilians earn two to three times more than their black counterparts. The wealthiest strata of Brazilian society remains 82% white, and the poorest strata is 76% black. Afro-Brazilians have far less access to quality education, healthcare or fair wages, and they are underrepresented in the government. The most prominent African-derived religions in Brazil are Candomblé and Umbanda. Umbanda centers on the belief in spirits, both good and evil. Candomblé is derived from the belief systems of a number of African ethnic groups, particularly the Yoruba, Fon and Bantu. Similar to the Orishas of Santeria practiced in Cuba and other regions, the deities of Candomblé are called the Orishas. Over time, they have become syncretized with Roman Catholic saints. This dates back to when enslaved Africans were forbidden by their European masters from practicing their African religions and so had to do so in secret under the guise of praying to Catholic saints. Because of the historical ties between Candomblé and Catholicism, Catholicism is also widely practiced amongst Afro-Brazilians. One Afro-descendant saint venerated in Brazil is Escrava Anastasia, a slave woman of African descent who was depicted wearing a metal face mask. The story goes that her master's wife accused her of flirting with her husband and as a punishment forced her to wear an iron mask over her face for the rest of her life until she died from tetanus from the rusty metal. The biggest Afro-Brazilian festival is the festival of Yemanja, 
Celebrated every February 2nd in Gil Vermelho, the festival brings together members of several religions, including Catholics and practitioners of the Afro-Brazilian religions Candomblé and Umbanda. Yemanja is the Orisha of the sea and loosely corresponds to the Cuban Orisha Yemaya. It is custom to lay offerings for the goddess of flowers, jewellery and food. And of course, Brazil is famous for its carnival around Mardi Gras. There are celebrations across the country, but the most famous is hosted in Rio de Janeiro, where over 5 million people participate in the street parties. One key element of the carnival is the samba music and dance, a clear vestige of African influence in Brazilian culture. The fast footwork of samba dancing originated in the dances practiced by the enslaved Africans who were trafficked to Brazil. And the singing style is derived from the traditional call and response style that Africans would use to evoke their orishas during religious ceremonies. Another Afro-Brazilian style of dance is capoeira, which combines martial arts moves with elements of dance and acrobatics to create graceful and flowing sequences. It's originated amongst enslaved Africans in Brazil who sought to hone their combat skills without arousing the suspicion of their masters. In 2014, it was declared an expression of intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO. The Afro-Brazilian Museum, located in São Paulo, is home to over 6,000 works pertaining to Afro-Brazilian history, culture and heritage. It seeks to celebrate the art and accomplishments of Africans and Afro-Brazilians and is the largest collection of artifacts of African descent in Latin America. Black Awareness Day has been celebrated annually in Brazil since the year 1960. It's held on November 20th to honour the life of Afro-Brazilian slave resistance fighter Zumbi. Famous Afro-Brazilians include the footballers Pelé and Ronaldinho, the scholar and politician Abgias do Nascimento, actress Zezé Mota and the politician Benedita da Silva who became the first black woman in the Brazilian Senate. That brings me to the end of our video on the African diaspora in Brazil. For more videos don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Instagram at Freedom Is Mine Official. I'll see you in the next video. Freedom is mine.